Welcome to this short series, Let's Build a Car. There'll be several videos in this series, with the first one introducing the project. And so we begin with a bare shell, and by the end, we'll have a car which starts and drives, and will be optioned with lots of stuff it didn't have before. <laughs> For a start, working air conditioning is one. But we'll also add power steering, central locking, power mirrors, comprehensive instrumentation, and a radio CD player. And we're doing all of this with genuine Toyota parts. So then, what has all this got to do with systems? Stacks, heaps, loads. There are basic mechanical systems. There are mechanical systems that incorporate hydraulics. There are electrical and electronic systems. There are electromechanical systems. We can also look at calculating ratio and looking at gear reduction drives. And there are loads of applications where basic leverage is used. So, now we've said all that, we can take a look at the car as it arrived a couple of months ago in February. You can see the clear coat on the roof is delaminated and you can't do anything with that, you have to take it off. Now the colour coat underneath was stable, I'm just going to shoot back to it now. Uh, that means that it can be primed over the base colour uh, because that was stable. So that's what we ended up doing. The interior was old and messed up, you can see the side of the seat is all torn up. Uh, that's pretty standard, UV damage and all that sort of business. Uh, not really worth repairing. I had some interior parts from another vehicle, as well as going to the records and buying a passenger seat, which I think was $53. There's a bonnet. Can you pull that stick up over there? And the black thing goes in the hole? Yep. So it's got a noise in the air conditioning pump. Air conditioning can press it down there. Look at that. Oh, that's so cactus. So the noisy air conditioning uh, compressor bearing was the last thing on my mind, really. This engine, or well, the car had done quite a high mileage. It needed a lot of work. The paint looked good, um, but close up. It was, I think there was something like 23 dents I ended up getting out of it. So we pulled it apart. I didn't want to paint it the same color. I don't mind this dark blue, but because this is a, a pre-airbag car, I wanted a brighter, safer color. So we've got the engine out there. That one went back into a car that Toyota bought back on account of Takata airbag recalls where they won't repair them. They're actually buying the cars back and destroying them. Engine bay looks nice and dirty. I'm pointing there at the steering rack and the union that goes inside the car where the steering wheel is connected. And that all came out and has been since changed the power steering. And we'll go into what the differences in all of those are shortly, um, or at least in the next video. Um, there's the old engine there. This required a lot of cleaning up and changing the colours a big job. Toyota paint them in the engine bay on the outside of the car and also on the inside of the car. So it was a lot of work to change the colour. It's something you've really got to want to do. Um, so I pulling it apart, you can see the bottom of that fender or guard. Um, there's inches of pine needles and mud. That is exactly a recipe um, for rust. But of course these cars are um, galvanised essentially. So rust isn't really a problem with them. Um, because all the wiring's coming out, I'm changing everything on the inside. The dashboard's coming out as well. And you can see behind there the fan, the air conditioner, and the heater. The heater's the one in the middle. And, of course, this is from a car I pulled apart a while ago that was written off. That car I actually bought new in 1998. That's the wiring loom from it. And that car was equipped with power mirrors and door locks and all sorts of other stuff. And I wanted to compare the, or compare, I should say, what was involved with changing the wiring to accommodate all the options I wanted to put in. And of course, where they enter the vehicle and all this sort of stuff is different. This is the earlier model. So some of the stuff isn't sort of retrofitable. Um, I cut myself pretty badly here. <laughs> but, you know, it all turned out well in the end. That all cleaned up and the car's all looking very good now. But um, you don't get to see until we've done a paint. So we're still pulling the wiring out, and it can get quite complicated because there's, there's the bonnet release cable you can see hanging onto the car. Um, the interior is now just bare pressed steel with dirt all over it. Uh, we have to wash that all off um, for it to be ready to be painted, and all the rubber grommets have to come out as well. So 
So of course here it is after its first power wash. Um, I missed a couple of bits actually, there was still quite a lot to take out of it, even though it looks quite bare. <laughs> the front suspension and brakes had to come out and I ended up kicking out the windshield because it had a bullseye and that's not a very worthy item. And I don't like old windshields anyway because it's difficult seeing through them when you're driving into the sun. So look, it's just a cheap car and to do this isn't really worth it. I did it because I enjoyed doing it. I get an immense amount of enjoyment out of getting trashed old cars and making them look brand new again. Um, I've got a, a history of doing that. So we're now ready to give it basically a shampoo and a degrease, more degreasing, and give it a good hose out and then we're ready to get it prepared for paint. I've just got to rub back the inside, very haphazardly, it doesn't have to be professionally done. <laughs> um, just rub it back a bit and what that will allow us to do, I'm going to put my gun down, is it going to stay there? It will now. Uh, what that will do um, is it will just give us a key for the primer to stick to. So I haven't rubbed back any of this yet. <laughs> that feels weird. Well then, that is our little stylo, all in primer, inside and out, which is ridiculous, but I'm ridiculous. Um, it feels lovely and smooth. There are a couple of screw ups in it and they will probably show through the paint. That primer's a bit thin on the roof there. So there's the car in its final colour, which is a Toyota colour called Turquoise Tropicana. Very popular in the early to mid 90s. By the late 90s, it started disappearing. Uh, I like it because it stands out. I don't like being noticed in cars, but in small cars like this where safety is an issue, uh, yes, I want to be seen. Um, so the door's been fitted, probably a bit previously. The paint was still not very long since it was applied. So from here, there's a clear coat applied, which is like a, think of it like a varnish, if you like. It's just a clear coat that protects the metallic. You have to clear coat metallics. We're just checking the shut lines there. Um, that's why the jack was under the door. And those, those lines need to be even so the door seal contacts its relevant area properly and also the doors open and close correctly. So once the doors are fitted, um, we fit the guards, the front guards or fenders, whatever you want to call them and get the car ready to be clear coated and of course we're fitting up the front guard now um, this stuff is all painted separately because the shell they, that's how they sort of painted in the factory i believe there was a lot of the dark blue which i wanted to get rid of there's nothing worse than looking at a car that's had a color change opening the bonnet's a different color or under the wheel arches are a different color and all that sort of thing which is why i sort of made sure everything that toyota had painted um, was done the same. So it's a bit of fettling to get it to fit well, but uh, we got there in the end. Not bad enough for a day. Um, it's all paint inside. I left the tank in. Um, that's the crash bar on the ground. That's a dash brace. 
of a silver carpet that can stay silver because the dash brace itself is silver um this masking didn't turn out too bad we saved the rubber from getting paint on it there are a couple of little there's a bit of tape there and i don't know a bit of crap there i can always brush touch that i'm not worried about it at the end of the day i just didn't want green on you know on the rubbers um a couple of scratches i've left in it these are all under the scuttle so yeah don't care um so yeah just got a clear coat i've fitted up the guards the doors um our rusty bit there looks pretty good it's nice and sealed up and it's all green inside you won't see any of that even the roof is green and of course this is where our video begins the shell is painted and clear coated it hasn't had the paint um, wet sanded and buffed but this is a good starting point for our series it looks pretty good doesn't it we're just getting some bits and pieces ready some of this junk's out of the blue car i just threw it in here because it was there um steering columns accelerator pedals carpet mats we're not quite ready for those yet crash bars all sorts of things in here now i have put the wiring in the wiring does need a bit of a clean up things like there around there that sort of thing just to make it look a bit prettier because but the car is you know quite you know what i mean once we buff it it's going to look almost new you know but um i needed to get that engine out pronto because the blue car went off today as we saw and there's a few things on that engine that i need to clean up it just looks a little bit shabby I'm not going to paint anything on it, nothing like that. Just a little bit of a scrub, just to make it look a bit smarter. And then we can put it in. Um, so I'll tie that wiring loom off to the hydraulic lines. And it'll create enough room. I haven't put the master in yet or anything like that. And of course this battery frame means that I'm going to have to bring it in on something of an angle. And scoop it under there. I'm just a bit worried about scratching the finish in here. Um, if I do, I'll brush touch. No big deal. So the rear brakes are all done. Um, they're adjusted and the new drums and you know the wheel cylinders and linings from the other car which have only done 20,000 k's is all in there um, so that's all done uh, so there's the spare I can put this in that just sits in there but um, I'll put that in just to get it off the ground and create a bit more room before we get caught up in too much of that we're going to do a bit of good old-fashioned grommet washing um, there's all sorts of clips and bits and pieces in here They've just been sitting in a container with dishwashing liquid and we can just spruce them up, make them look a bit nicer. Um, the idea is, I mean, I don't like doing anything unless it looks nice. Headlight adjusters are in here. That's ink, printer ink on my finger. These are, you know, important to look good in my... We couldn't, um, we couldn't, pre we couldn't, what do you call it, plate anything um, with the restrictions going on, but it's mainly about grommets. Um, really not the face of the grommet so much as the um sort of ceiling area in there just to make sure they you know seal up these are for the floor and also the well underneath the spare tire that's the reason i'm sort of doing these so just a quick spruce we don't have to get too carried away with that even though the actual act of grommet washing is a massive case of um ridiculous so this is all fairly self-explanatory. We're just putting plastic plugs back in. That holds the scuttle on under the windscreen wipers. And this one at the front is for the headlight. And they're quite difficult to get out because they're 25 years old and quite brittle. But you can't leave them in and paint the car. It just doesn't look right. Even though you don't see them, I just don't like that sort of work. There are a whole bunch of grommets. There's big rubber ones for draining the floor. If there's ever a mishap inside the car and the, the car needs to be drained, these ones here. There's also a whole raft of probably two dozen stick-on grommets and the purpose of those, the sills under the doors are opened up so that the dipping solution when the car's manufactured can uh, enter and then drain out when the car's, uh, when they've finished emerging the car. Uh, just really getting stuff off the floor, there's the spare tyre that goes in, pretty self-explanatory stuff, there's no rocket science there. Um, just a matter of getting as much stuff in the car as we can to get it off the floor. Here's our little vehicle. We've started getting bits and pieces ready for reassembly. We've got a heater unit there and we'll explain how that works in a moment. And we've also begun threading some of the wiring through. Now that's the first thing we need to do because a lot of other components go over the top of that. So we need to make sure everything's prepared adequately. We've got fasteners and so forth in bags there. And a little bit of uh, COVID-19 evidence. 
we have grommets, we've started fitting the grommets in the car. These sorts of areas here and also on the floor. There and underneath our bag. They're all over the place. Underneath the rear seat with the fuel tank is, there's a couple of grommets as well. This is all stuff we tend to put in first. There's also a series of them in the engine bay down here as well. Now, the wiring loom is loosely threaded through. Two main looms go into the vehicle. One there. Much easier to thread the wiring, the main parts of the wiring through now before the engine's in situ. Uh, so what we'll do, essentially these engines, and there it is over there, are designed to go in through the bottom. When the cars are built, the engines are put in with machinery from the bottom. And in servicing it's the same because we have a large battery tray there which we can't remove because it's structural. There's a mount for the engine underneath. The steering system's in. That's the power steering there. That is a rack and pinion, so that post you can see protruding there rotates on a flat gear. And as that rotates, the gear moves to and fro. It's connected to the wheels underneath and moves the wheels accordingly. Some of the hydraulics are in. So some of the brake lines are in now. They go to a uh, proportioning valve there. The servo and brake master cylinder isn't fitted yet. And we'll talk about how that system works as well. So I'm going to tie the wiring. We'll clean it up a little bit more. And we'll pull the wiring off to the side and cable tight and secure it off to the firewall, which is the firewall is this piece of steel here. And that will allow room for the engine to go in. Other items worthy of mention, the fuse box. This has fuses and relays in it. Um, they're designed for circuit protection. If I can get this a little. And in there you'll find some of the fuses. Others are in the cabin. And a series of relays. These are electric switches. And there's bigger ones here as well. So that's what we're up to at the moment. So we're just tidying up now. This is an old-fashioned Toyota diagnostics box uh, where you would plug an approved um, piece of apparatus in that would read engine codes and do this sort of stuff. Um, nowadays they use OBD2 stuff, which is sort of the standard that manufacturers have adopted. So we'll just secure this stuff. It also helps orientate the wiring the way we want it. So we know the wiper goes in there, that can stay there. There's more bracketry to go down here and also it helps me understand a little bit too. Um, baby steps as you're doing this sort of stuff. These next bits have to do with the fuel system. Here we have a canister and this canister is just full of activated charcoal. It's basically a granular component that will soak up nasty gases, but it will get to the point where it saturates. Now, in the case of a car, this is ported by that pipe down to the fuel tank. The fuel cap's sealed. In the early days, a fuel cap would have a vent in it, so as fuel expands and contracts in the tank, those gases would escape into the atmosphere. But the, the tank's sealed, the cap's sealed, so any expansion will come up through this pipe, sit in the activated charcoal, out of harm's way. And once the engine started, it's ported by that into the engine where it's burnt. So this guy just fits down in here, somehow, there's a bracket on it, and I'm putting it in before the fuel, the thing, this thing here is the fuel filter, so I'm just going to pop him down in there, again, it's out of harm's way when we put the engine in, uh, that little guy there bolts onto the side, and we can plumb it up and I can secure the fuel filter. Right, that goes there. That's just a, a vent for a fuel tank. If I can get it on, it's quite stiff. There we go. And there's a clamp down here that's fine, which we're going to pop back on as well. Uh, I'll just get my pliers, it might make it easier. These are long nose pliers, for obvious reasons. Um, I refer to them as needle nose, which is probably more an Americanism. Uh, Nipex. I always use Nipex stuff. I, I view it as the best. It's about $70 for a set of those. They're not cheap, um, but you can thrash them and they won't break. There we go, it's nice and secured. I've got to put this little box on the side here. 
that's the fuel return for the fuel injection, that's the fuel feed for it. We'll go into what all that stuff does later, it's not relevant for the minute. So all we need to do is just a couple of bolts in there to hold the fuel filter against the firewall, or against that bracket, and then we'll just start securing all this stuff. So this little bloke here is called a MAP sensor, Manifold Absolute Pressure, and it measures the vacuum in the engine. That's very important for fuel injection, and we'll go into why when we talk about the sensors on the engine and how the fuel injection system works. I'm going to mount it for now. It mounts up on the firewall over yonder, that way. I'll stick it on now, and that gets another thing out of, the, out of its bag um, as we prepare. So we'll just secure this thing here. Um, when we're looking, we're in really, really good, um, really, really good position now. Um, everything's quite understandable. It will make sense once you see more of it on, and I'll explain it probably a bit better at the moment. We're just sort of banging stuff together. Um, these all fit to the engine, and they all fit to the engine, and these all fit to the engine. So you've got sensors. Oh, you've got a master cylinder one in there too. You've got sensors, fuel injectors, all this sort of stuff. Of course, that goes on the battery. That's the positive for the battery. So let's go back to this steering. This is called the steering rack under here that runs the width, well, sort of the width of the firewall. It's a power steering rack, which is the reason it's got all this tape around to stop it leaking oil. Here's a compensator valve. When we go hard onto each lock, that will bring the idle speed up on the car a bit to cater for the extra load on the pump. There's a, a pump connected to this which is connected through two ports here and that gives it assistance as you turn it. Now this is connected directly to the steering wheel by a shaft. So it's turning rotational movement into linear movement. Now there's a ratio associated with this. Now when we talk about ratio we can talk about the relationship of dividing one number by total. That's pretty easy. So if you've got one blue car and three red cars, well the ratio is one to three. We can work out the ratio of this, but it's a bit different. So for example, when we talk, when we talk about steering ratio, we're talking about the relationship of turning by the steering wheel to the turning of the front wheel. So it's more complicated. Okay, so we've got a little compensator, um, which is vacuum operated off the engine. And as we said, it just brings the revs up a little bit when you're on a full lock. It doesn't create and that's all the world's problems. I mean, it doesn't compensate for no money in your wallet, or 100 bucks, or <laughs> I've lost weight, whatever. Um, so this looks like, I don't think it's a tapered gas thread. Some things like this have a gas thread on them, a tapered gas thread. So I'm just gonna use some plumber's Teflon, and I'm using this tiny roll because it's all I've got. I've run out, because I use this stuff quite a lot. I've left these open, they should have been blocked off. Um, on the off chance that debris, any sort of foreign debris got in there, but this is another thing which we can get we can get to with engineering, but I'm just going to put it in now. So I have to get it in with the engine zinc. Oops, I'm going to use that in this way. And again, we'll just thread that through there to keep it out of harm's way. This is a brake booster. It's essentially a big diaphragm. There's a big rubber diaphragm in there which the engine vacuum moves. Uh, it moves it when you push your brake pedal. That's connected to your brake pedal. And the engine diaphragm will assist the effort that you're putting in to push this out. Now it's important we don't push that out without a master cylinder attached to it. We can dislodge something inside. But what it does is it makes your brakes easier to use. Um, I'm going to pop it in. It goes through, and the reason I'm popping it in now is I need to put it in to support the whoops, the pedals. Another thing worthy of mentioning is there's a gasket on the back of it. Um, and that will go in to there and sit against the firewall. I'm a bit reluctant to put the master cylinder on because that's going to get in the way when I put the engine in. Um, I mean, it won't get in the way, if you know what I mean, too much, but it will um, inhibit some of the movement I've got. Here's our master cylinder. Now, I'm being really careful with this because I don't want any brake fluid, which it has got fluid in it, getting on the paint of the car. It will corrode the paint or at least lift it. Uh, brake fluid is what's called hygroscopic, so it absorbs moisture. Um, it will come out of a bottle either a clear um, creamy colour, but it's very, very clear, um, or a clear blue. But once it's been in the system for a while, you find it's cloudy, and that's the reason. It's, it's soaked up moisture. I am going to pop it on. Yeah, I want to hook a few things up, and it's going to be in the way if I don't. And we're just being a little bit careful. I'm keeping my eye peeled on it because I don't want, you know, I don't, I don't like the idea of fluid getting out. 
Um, so we'll just, that should go in without any problem. Like that. I'm going to stick up my nuts in just to secure it there. Um, it just, it's another thing that's kind of in the way, but it's not, if you know what I mean. So I think, when I, because I'm putting the engine in the wrong way, it could, I could find it's kind of inhibiting what I want to do. Brake fluid is very easy to neutralize. You just use water and it will just completely render it, pardon me, harmless to painted surfaces. But until you do that, it is actually very corrosive to paint. Uh, and again, you know, we'll explain how this all works in greater detail once it's hooked up and we bleed the brakes. We, we have to make it hydraulic, it's just nothing at the moment. So we have to make it operate in a hydraulic way. Um, and you know, it's all good fun. Great fun. I enjoy this. This is very therapeutic for me. Another component we can put on is the speedometer cable. It has it's only a fairly short one. It's got a nut on the end which screws onto the gearbox on the engine. Inside there's a flexible steel drive wire that the gearbox rotates and of course that goes on to connect to the back of the speedometer and give you a reading in kilometres an hour. Now most modern cars use what's called a speedo transducer so it's done electronically but these oldies we use a cable. Motorcycles still use cables, a lot of vehicles do. Again, I'm going to tie it off. This will go on the engine. I can poke it through the drywall, and there's a grommet that fits in there to make it all waterproof, and so I don't get any smelly stuff in the car from the engine or whatever. And we just pop him in. I'm going to twist these things in, and that's held up by that bracket there. I will leave some slack on it because generally with these, you will fit the speedometer, then push it back, then connect back to the engine because otherwise you can't pull the speedo out enough to get to the back of it. I'll show you what I'm talking about. I'll just get that in. It's like a really tricky ice cream lid. There we go. Sterling. And that can just stay in there. And that won't be in the way at all. So we're getting to the point now where we can't do much more in here because we're waiting for the engine. And these lines here, that's the high pressure from the power steering that comes off the pump on the engine. Of course, a lot of pressure in there, and that's the return line. There's normally a bottle sits here, um, but that's in the way of this top engine mount, so I'm leaving the bottle out. Of course, here's our instrument cluster. These gauges, that's your temperature, fuel, speedometer, and tachometer. That's a rev counter for the engine. Now, all of these are electronic, with exceptions to the speedo, and that's what the drive turns, that little guy there. Um, of course, if we... I'm, I'm right-handed, so hopefully I can do this. If we pop that in and rotate it, you can see the speedo moves. So that's the reason for the cable and the fitting on the end of it. It just plugs over there. We've got our power steering high pressure line. I'm just going to run in there with a cotton tip, just to make sure it's clean. Um, there's a bit of muck in there. We need all engine hydraulics to be squeaky clean because dirt will affect the sealing of them. And in saying that, it will drastically shorten the life of the component. Now, I'm just going to pop a bit of masking tape over here. When you do this sort of thing, you've got to make sure masking, like, masking tape actually has a finite life. So just make sure you fold the end of it, stick it under there, and that way you can find the end and just peel it off. I'm going to move them over that way a bit.
What do you reckon? Shit. Shit. <laughs>